Walking a path along the roots of Pikes Peak, you take a fork in the road to the Anselm Society Digital Pub. Inside is a raucous conversation on the arts, faith, and which of the Instagram filters works best? Did any of them actually do anything? In the corner table by the fire are three people. One of them is wishing he could take an interior shot just once that wasn't blurry. And that's me, uh, Matthew Melma, and welcome to Believe to See. We are a podcast of the Anselm Society Arts Guild. Uh, the Anselm Society is a coalition of churches across the front range of Colorado dedicated to a renaissance of the Christian imagination. Uh, to find out more about the Anselm Society, please visit us at anselmsociety.org. And while you're at it, why not uh, rate and review the show over at iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. That uh, helps us out a ton, and we really appreciate each one. And joined here by my co-host, Mandy Hauk. And uh, Mandy, this whole recording, it's a blast from the past, isn't it? Yeah, I, I didn't really miss it, but, you know, we do what we have to do when it's snowing outside. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. So, uh, listeners, if you're noticing the audio quality is not quite what we would want, um, we have been getting back to recording in person with our better sound equipment, and it was great, and that's what we were planning on doing tonight, but a uh, blizzard, or, well, not blizzard, but a snowstorm uh, stopped us, so we are going re uh, remotely, and we are we are soldiering on as best we can. Thank you very much for your patience. But Mandy, how, <laughs> how are you doing? I, I can't see your face, so uh, how, how are you doing over <laughs> over on the other side of town? I'm doing just fine. How are you? <laughs> I am doing okay. Um, I How often do you think about photography, like taking pictures? Or are you one of those people who has their iPhone like filled with pictures, or, 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 or you, is that not your jam? No, I do have it filled with pictures, but I'm sure you can guess my main subject is my dog, Winston. He's, you know, <laughs> and uh, the main reason I have so many pictures of him is because 95% of them are bad because mm. he's moving. So, yeah, I try to take pictures. I am not a photographer well, by any I, stretch of the imagination. I feel a lot of pressure. Do you know those aura frames where you like – a bunch of people can like upload photos into this central frame, then like uh, rotates through them in like this nice little uh, digital frame. Yes, my sister got one for my mom. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So I have several of those for like relatives, like one for my mom, one for my mother-in-law, mm -hmm. one for my grandma Pat. And there's a lot of competition. Like my grandma Pat, she looks to see who is <laughs> uploading the photos the most frequently. So. Oh, Grandma, golly. <laughs> if you're listening, I love you, and I'll be uploading more photos very quickly, and uh, probably more quickly than uh, Jeremy and Brian, so I'm your favorite grandson. I, um, hey, I could send you some pictures of Winston that you can, you know, share with Grandma Pat. <laughs> hey, hey Grandma, everyone here's, loves here's Winston. my friend's dog. Here, here you go. Everyone oh. loves Winston. <laughs> Never too many photos of Winston. There you anyway. go. Well, someone <laughs> else who probably has a lot of photos just sort of laying around in all sorts of forms, is our guest today, and that is Elizabeth Bristol-Clayton. Welcome to the pub table. Thank you for letting me be at the pub table. I feel so special. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Thank you. That makes us feel special. Um, so first, first question, um, Elizabeth is one of the most versatile names in the world for nicknames. <laughs> there's Elizabeth, there's Liz, there's Lizzie, there's Beth. Yes. Which one of those do you prefer? Um, I usually go with Liz. It just feels chummy, and my friends call me Liz, and I have chummy friends. It's good. Okay. Well, <laughs> would you prefer to use the professional name for the podcast? Or, you know, it's a pub <laughs> table, so I, I think Liz would it's probably true. be the right way to it's go. It's true. Let, you, let's do that. It's a pub night after all. Okay. So, uh, Liz, uh, we're having you on to talk about your main uh, art form, which is photography. And yes. I'm really excited about this because photography is one of those things where most everyone tries in some form or another, and most everyone does it badly. So it's nice to see the people who know what they're doing and can do it well. But before we get into all of that, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes. So, um, I'm Liz. <laughs> I am a, I guess, newer a resident to the Colorado Springs area and very joyful um, new member of Anselm <laughs> Society and the Believe to See Pub. <laughs> um, and uh, I hail from Texas. My family has been there for 
goodness, five generations. So at some point, I, I felt a bit like Bilbo. I needed to see mountains again. <laughs> so I moved to the mountains. But I have uh, a background in primarily, I suppose, wedding and portrait photography, but some other, yeah, explorational photography. I've done it for the past uh, nine years now. I've had my own business as a wedding photographer and have just really enjoyed um, exploring that art myself. And it's, a, I mean, there's a lot of my story I could go into as to how and why photography in many ways, um, yeah, kind of met me in a, in a difficult place with in like high school and college, um, I was really struggling with mental health issues and things. And so this beautiful art form became then a profession and a joy. And um, I'm also, I suppose, <laughs> besides photography, I am a communications uh, person in many parts of the world and um, a writer as well. So that's a bit about me. All right. And, and part of your communications person stuff is your would it be fair to say you're you're me and Mandy's boss over the uh, Believe to See? Like you're you're kind of I in suppose. charge of the yes. end something that Believe to See is under. So why don't you tell us a little bit yes. about the, about that work? Yes. So I'm the new communications director for the Anselm Society, which kind of means I, I feel like I flew into the Anselm Society as excited to <laughs> jump into everything as I possibly could. And um, being a huge fan from afar for the last probably three years, I entered the world and asked uh, our, our dear beloved Brian Brown, what can I do? What can I do? Give me a, give me a task and I shall do anything. And so, uh, yes, because a lot of my background is in communication, I saw just many areas in which um, the Anselm Society has been so important and powerful to me in my own life. And yet there's so many more ways that it could be connected to people who want to know more about us and what we are about. And it's hard sometimes to, if you ask um, an Anselm person, what is the Anselm Society, for them to be able to tell you in a short sentence, they usually go off into some quotation from the Iliad or mm. <laughs> some, something or other. And then you're excited, but a little confused. And so, and I know... I just think there's so many more that could benefit from us. So I finally got to attend in person the conference this past year in September. And I was I was the photographer for one of, or one of them, <laughs> I should say, for the conference and ran around like a chicken with my head cut off, loving every moment of it. And Brian said to me, you should enjoy, like, sit down and enjoy. And I was like, I will. I'm just so excited. I have to take photos of everything. <laughs> and so, um, yes, I suppose in that way, vi visually communicating and then also, um, yeah, working on Lots of website, social media, and um, overall digital presence to the world, and thus the podcasts. All right. Well, something that I have been thinking about with, with photography is how much it has changed in just the past, like, couple decades. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm an elder millennial, so I'm old enough to remember <laughs> when you had to buy film and each one of your photos cost money. They had to go take them and get them developed. Then when I was like in a teenager, like cell phone pictures were kind of a thing, but they're all kind of crappy. So everyone had a sort of crappy digital camera. And now it's just ubiquitous. Um, Mandy, you <laughs> yes. affirm me in this because I, I get the feeling uh, I don't want to know how much younger Liz is than me, but she probably is. So she's probably like, wow, that's <laughs> the, that's a novelty old old man. So affirm me in this, please, Mandy. Oh, I'll just affirm you in the feeling of oldness. I appreciate that. Like, join me in that feeling. As a Gen Xer, yes, I <laughs> believe me, I remember film. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I think to some extent, I think it's a little bit of a loss because I, I was really good at developing all those pictures and I have mm. all those and I, I have completely lost track of photos since because they're so easy to take and then what do you do with them other than leave them on your phone and so mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. i a, a part of me kind of even though yes it's expensive to pay to have all those pictures developed there was a treasure to it mm -hmm. and there was a um i don't know i remember getting the photos the prints back in the mail and <laughs> i would always get them in triplicate so that i could send photos to the grandparents and you know and so now i don't remember the last i mean the last time 
well, I do remember the last time I printed photos. It was to make little photo albums for the tables at our daughter's wedding. And I was like, wow, I this is archaic mm-hmm. almost. <laughs> but I, I miss that to yeah. a degree because I don't know yeah. how in the world I'm going to catch up on printing all my photos. Yeah. yeah. You know, I actually <laughs> love film. I had my old, uh, my uncle's old film camera I used to use and you had to put so much thought into the one yes. photo that you would take mm-hmm. or the 12 maybe that you had on, on your role. And mm-hmm. I love that. I think it's a last practice. I think there, in many ways it, it's helped me in my own profession now doing digital yeah. things all the time of, you no, know, think about it, be contemplative about this process and, mm-hmm. and don't just get shutter happy as I like to call it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I, there would I not be s- nearly so many pictures of Winston if I in- had <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm just thinking, cause when I, you know, obviously when I, I was when I was really little my mom had to like buy film for each of the photos she took the thought mm-hmm. of how many photos of me as an infant would exist in the world if my mom could just take an unlimited amount and <laughs> what <laughs> yeah. what all of my kids are going to do with all the pictures I have of them once they become a teenager it's like here look at all these 20,000 photos I took you when you were two Ugh, yeah. but, yeah. but it, it is really interesting the sort of yeah, photos are ubiquitous now. So, mm-hmm. so Liz, as someone who takes photos professionally, how is mm-hmm. it dealing with this medium where everyone does it, even if like ninety nine point nine percent of the people who do it do it, you know, not not too great. Do do it on my level. <laughs> mm, yeah, I mean. It's such an interesting question, too, because even for myself, I I recognize my age and space and time is even further along. We have, I mean, our culture now has instant gratification all the time, but Mm -hmm. do we have meaning out of that gratification? And I think... It's interesting. Uh, I remember when I was first starting out learning how to use my DSLR camera and <laughs> taking horrible photos of a small stream or my <laughs> my sister's hair or a cat <laughs> or whatever. And mm-hmm. but I went, when I would work at it, and then I just got an amazing photo of a cat's ear. I was so proud, and I was just <laughs> <laughs> it just felt like I'd made something so masterful out of the delicate hairs on on the cat's ear and. And I think now, because, yes, it, it is something I think we, we grapple with, but I think really image making, photography can be a way of meaning making and actually slowing down your life. Um, I think on using your phone, it, it can actually help with that as well. Like, you can do this. It's not, you don't just have to have a large cam- fancy camera to do this. Um, but I do think... Yeah, being able to slow down the process of your life and how many times are we flipping from screen to screen, from Twitter feed to Facebook to, <laughs> you know, the, the news and then just we will it will end and kind of feel disjointed and disembodied and unfor sure about where we are in our own lives. And so um, for me, beginning out, I think photography is something that can it it almost forces you to slow down and if you think about like let's say you're outside with or in in nature with your family on a walk and you see a beautiful sunset and what has to happen for you to take a photo of it okay you don't keep walking and scrolling you have to physically stop your feet you have to Mm -hmm. pull out your body and you have to like hold steady and you have to focus and then mm. you have to capture. And there's like almost a contemplative process of that, I think. And a, a full, like an embodiment that can almost happen within that of just like, what does it mean to slow down, to pause in our own lives, to reflect upon this is a beautiful sunset. And then a step further than that, like this means something and I want to capture it. And it's funny because I think now sometimes of taking photos as engaging with time in a very special way you're not just passing through it as if it didn't matter you're stopping for a moment and almost stamping meaning upon your own life by taking a photo and stamping even if you're frustrated even if you're overwhelmed even if there are many things in your life which are not going well taking a photo can be an act of defiance even against the darkness and an act of saying this is good um, and mm. I love that. I just really love that. So, yeah, and that that is an interesting way to look at it because I will say I I do not come naturally to the whole photo. 
taking thing. Like mm-hmm. I, I've had one of the many reasons I've, I've had a lot of trouble warming up to Instagram is just <laughs> the fact that it's such a visual thing. I, I just have a hard time. Like I need to take like a fancy photo and uh-huh. <laughs> but it, it almost seems like then a big part isn't so much the, you know, the fancy camera or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's, it, it all seems like learning to pay attention. Would that be a fair way to put yes. it? Yes, absolutely. And you know, I think this is funny that we're talking about this now. For Lent, I have take I've got off of social media. I've got off of my Instagram, which I have not done in years. <laughs> and I knew it was coming. I knew the Lord was like, "You need to do this. This is good." And I was like, "I know. I know. I'm getting there." But finally, it was a perfect moment and I got off. And I think and, and what what you just said there Matt about, you know, paying attention. I think so much more and more Instagram was originally created for what? For us to share all of these meaningful parts of our lives. And yet we've, what do we do mostly when we're on Instagram? We scroll. (laughs) Right. (laughs) We're not posting anything. We're not sharing anything. We're just consuming. And uh, I think when you just become consumer, you, you can't pay attention to your own life and to how beautiful it is and to how many meaningful pieces are happening it. So I would even say a good practice for beginning, even with something like photography, is to honestly distance yourself from social media from these very things which are supposed to promote our own creativity can sometimes suck life out of it and Mm. so even taking like a a momentary fast from it or whatever i've found so much more i (laughs) i was hearing birds that i hadn't heard (laughs) the other day (laughs) and i was like wow that's marvelous and then when i went on a, a walk i just there were so many more things about my my little town that I live in that were so much more delightful. And you just paid attention to the texture of the sky or the way the snow was on the mountains today or, or whatever it was. And I think like, yeah, uh, photography can for sure be a way of paying attention to what's right here in front of you. And not only with the purpose of like, okay, I have to share immediately. Like some mm-hmm. things are wonderful to keep to yourself or just to share with a friend. I remember just starting my Lenten fast and I couldn't get on social media to post my cool photo of my coffee mug and my candle that morning. And so <laughs> I instead, I sent it to my friend, Nicole. And I was just like, this is my morning. Also, I miss you. And tell me about your life. And it was a great moment of like the two of us being able to connect over that one image that I had just taken for her at that point, not for the whole world to like appreciate or to like or to comment on, but it was just for one person. So I think like, yeah, paying attention. And then I think if it's anything, photography, image making, image making must turn into like meaning making and then making Mm -hmm. of connections, connection making. And so, yeah, I just think it's, it's really valuable. So I love yeah, that. And, yeah. yeah. And something that, that got me thinking of was the timing issue. Because, you know, this mm-hmm. kind of goes back to the sort of switch to digital, which, believe me, listeners, mm-hmm. my natural tendency is to be the old man yelling at the cloud and being being upset about all new things. But <laughs> objectively, the switch to digital is awesome in that it's so much easier for so mm-hmm. many people to take really good pictures. But one of the uh, one of the things that you had to do with the film is you would see something, you work really hard to get all the little settings right on your phone or not phone, your camera. camera. <laughs> wow, that's just how completely the iPhone is one. Um, on your camera, you take the picture, and then you know it's going to be a while. You need to go through this whole process before you can even see how it turned out. You can't just take it and share it right away. I, I would imagine mm-hmm. that would really change the the way you relate to your photography. Um, yes, <laughs> quite. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I also remember, um, Mandy, uh, you can make yes. fun of me for this if you want to. Um, oh, so good. things were switching to digital <laughs> by the time I was old enough to really take photos. So I didn't have a lot of experience taking film photos. But you remember those okay. disposable cameras? You'd like get your, oh, little, yeah. your kids are like, hey, it's a dollar. Oh, Here's 10 those. photos. I was one mm-hmm. of those little annoying um perfectionist kids who's like I don't want to waste these photos unless I know it's exactly right mm-hmm. so I never <laughs> took a photo <laughs> and then the right, mo- b- b- the right, the right moment still ahead. hasn't come Mandy oh no so wait do you still have a disposable camera that you've never 
taken pictures with. Is that what you're saying? I don't saying? know if I still have it, but wherever it is, it still has all 10 photos available. Oh, that's so sad. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that is so funny. Yeah. No, that was the other thing. Cause you'd be like, well, shoot, I don't want to waste my film, but I know <laughs> that the first few photos <laughs> on this role are really important, but oh mm-hmm. yeah, it was mm-hmm. a whole thing. It's true. <laughs> I actually think I have a couple of disposable cameras in a storage <laughs> box somewhere that I have no idea what's on them. I should go get those. Go to Walgreens. Run down to Walgreens. So, so Liz, there. I'm guessing you're, the vast majority of the photography, photography you've done is digital. But did, do you have experience doing like the film side too? And, what, and if so, what, what's mm-hmm. the difference in just the, the process? And uh, how have you found it yeah. changes the way you approach it? Yeah, I think, so I originally started out with um, digital, so I had a DSLR Canon, just began, I just bought this baby camera from my parents and I cried, it was wonderful. Anyway, so beginning off, yes, that's what I started with, and then as I was kind of beginning and then uh, continuing my education, one of my mentors said, like, you really need to shoot with film, and now any cool person in the photography world knows that you shoot if you're anyone, you shoot with film at least once <laughs> because it, it requires so much more, um, I wouldn't even just say talent, I would say discipline <laughs> and okay. uh, practice to really slow down and think about where is my light coming from, um, mm. how am I going to use it, uh, it and like, where am I going to place my subject? What is my subject? Why particularly am I choosing this subject as opposed to something else in a room? So let's say you have, you know, a plant, a chair and a teddy bear all in a chair in a, in a room. And you're going to choose to take a photo of all three of them or one of them or a piece of them. You have to really think about what you do and with digital you can take as many photos as you want <laughs> many different <laughs> angles many different framings many different lightings this can be really dark it can be really light and with film you have to really slow that down so i took our a film camera on a family vacation once and i only had i only had 12 shots and it was a two-week vacation <laughs> and i was just like oh my goodness what am i gonna do but i when i i really slowed down and we would go out on a and an outing in a beautiful part of the mountains. And I was just like, oh, I don't I don't think it's right yet. And I'm not sure why. <laughs> and so the sunset it will get a... more orange in, yes. in 20 minutes. I just know it. <laughs> yes, yes. So that was, I think, so valuable then for um, what my main medium is, which is digital photography. Still on a digital camera, like a physical <laughs> camera, not your phone. But it really influences that still. And like, I can tend to be shutter happy and take a million photos and I don't think it's always the best practice in the world I think whenever I take a ton I'm always a little bit disappointed with myself of okay you weren't paying attention close enough like you weren't focusing in on like what really needed to be told and especially Mm -hmm. with wedding photography or documentary photography you're telling a story of a day of a process and of people and of connection and of meaning making and so you really have to focus in on what is important what is valuable um and what will what will mean something and so i would say even for those uh who do use their phone as their primary medium if you can if you have access to a dslr camera or just a digital camera like that's i would say one step back from your phone it's something that requires you to be a bit more thoughtful and also it i tell you it is a workout (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> when you are taking photos on a digital camera because you have to I mean it's, it doesn't look particularly attractive the person who's taking photos like you have to squat down you have to I mean the amount of cricks and in, in my neck and back and different <laughs> things I've had are really <laughs> funky and odd um and then I'm also uh, right eye or sorry right-handed but left eye dominant so the way I oh. hold my camera is really funky <laughs> And it looks like someone that's clawing a strange object in their hand. And um, anyways, so that's a little bit comical. So it's it's not the most, you know, beautiful looking thing in the world, but that's not the point. The point is, of course, to get get a good image. And so, yeah, there's a lot that's required because you're doing all these mental gymnastics of 
what are my settings at? Where's my lighting at? Is someone moving? Mm-hmm. Is my shutter speed high enough <laughs> to do this? <laughs> and then also working with people in that time of like, okay, so grandma's going to come in here. Oh, watch your step. Okay, we have about five minutes. We're actually five minutes behind now. <laughs> and so there's like a lot of different <laughs> things that are going into that. So I do think that in many ways, slowing down the process on my own time when I'm not on someone else's crunch time is really helpful because it really helps to hone in what is important and then what am I going to focus on so that when you're in the madness of a wedding day or a family shoot or whatever it is, because everyone, everyone's on flurrying time schedules, um, you can focus in on what those are. And so, yeah, I've really enjoyed that in wedding photography, which is just Oh, goodness. The madness of that is <laughs> is unparalleled and so many stories. But yeah, and then I've also been able to enjoy that, especially in some of, I guess I would say, <laughs> I, I want to call them like alternative photography, like alternative music or something like that. But um, <laughs> in some of these like very creative freelance uh, projects that I've done that are have nothing don't have people involved exactly but they're more of my um, I guess contemplative almost devotional practices of image making and so I did a project um, this past last spring yes that's right we're in March my goodness Um, (laughs) and I got to kind of focus on the I, I went really, <laughs> really abstract with it, and then made it really physical and 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 visual. But um, the sacramental nature of prayer, and <laughs> so to do that, I um, did this thing called double exposure imagery, which is you've probably seen it before. Two images like overlaid on top of each other, mm-hmm. and um, so for my backdrop, the first image I would take. Uh, was of these beautiful um, stained glass windows in a Catholic church where my family's from in Dallas. And they were just the most wonderful um, color-filled stained glass windows, as stained glass windows are. And then the other Mm -hmm. overlaid image were of... um, hands positioned in a diff- in specific ways. So some like clasped in prayer, others opened um, toward the sky, and then another kind of open palmed upward. And yeah, those were overlaid of things uh, of different stained glass images. So one is supposed to be kind of a sacramental look at the Eucharist, and another is supposed to be kind of the visceral, like, more dark night of the soul. There's lots of blue and dark imagery in it. And then the third one is red and gold, and that one is entitled Lex Orandi, Lex Credendi, which is um, Mm -hmm. Latin for the law of prayer is the law of belief. And Mm -hmm. I think visually, I just really wanted to demonstrate, like, what does it look like to, like, what would hands look like? if they were praying against stained glass and like we pray in churches. So that seemed natural. And then also like, but what are different postures for hands? They're not just, not just class. There's sometimes that we fight with God. There's sometimes Mm -hmm. that we're desperate and we're pleading and we're weeping. And so my sister who is trained in classical ballet (laughs) has very pliable hands (laughs) and can can position them in in all of these beautiful ways. And so poor thing, I made her, or I asked her to kind of help me with the project. And so both of us were sweating by the end of it because of the different (laughs) positions and like how, how still you had to be against the stained glass and everything. But they turned out so well, and I was so excited um, for them. And I think, especially in that season of mine, which has just been a such a hard... I mean, it was amidst 2020 coming into 2021, and such a difficult period for so many. And I think I learned a different, like a different level of prayer. It was almost like a, a video game's other level had been unlocked with <laughs> prayer. <laughs> I love that. That's great. And, and I realized, like, wow, there's so much more depth here and like just this guttural kind of um honesty with the lord that i had in that time which was Mm. not always pretty (laughs) and (laughs) always delightful or fun and so but i really i just thought about like okay i think this in a way it helped me to kind of visualize what was it that like prayer personally felt like and be able to give not words to that, but image and light and color to it and um, form. And then for other people, I wanted to almost reach out to others who I feel like we're going through the same thing. And so, yeah, that's been like a really 
powerful thing, even for me, to keep coming back to those images and to almost it's weird to say you can be like personally ministered to through something that you <laughs> took because it sounds egotistical but <laughs> I, I i really have been like so um yeah humbled by it and then like continually i guess encouraged by it which is funny to say so oh no but i love the way that god did that for you like mm. um he drew you to that for such a greater purpose than you or- originally thought because i'm sure you didn't expect mm. the reverberations i guess of no. ministry um yeah. you thought it was something that you were creating co-creating or you know being in the image of god as dorothy sayer said you know mm-hmm. you you being a creator is the the most distinct way that you are created mm-hmm. in the image of god mm-hmm. and so i love that that um in this case in particular, is it may, has that happened to you before with other images you've created or is it yes. specifically this one? I think so. I think sometimes, I think this happens a few times perhaps in an artist's life where they take, mm-hmm. they either write something or they paint something or they take an image of something and it feels almost as if it was made or went beyond them mm-hmm. <laughs> and beyond yeah. even their own. I mean, I'm sure you're, you've both have experienced this before, but something that was like they were a part of, but then it went and like took, had took wings and like flew yes. off as this beautiful phoenix in front of them. And <laughs> yeah, I think that has happened before. I often come back to actually a series of photos that I took at age 16 when I was, oh goodness, in the throes of, um, anxiety and depression and a terrible eating disorder and I I just took this like tiny little pilgrimage around my house and it was in (laughs) in the thick of winter in Texas which is not quite the thick I understand now (laughs) the thin of winter the the thin for for Texas at least and everything was you know bleak and sad and I took my camera and I took just this little (laughs) I the best way I can describe it is pilgrimage like through the garage all the way around um, our house. We have a little bit of property in our house. And I just, I took photos of, it was the dog. It was the light coming through the window in the garage. Mm. It was the leaves, the dead, dead leaves <laughs> along mm-hmm. the path. And then um, the bleak kind of pasture land and then the woods and then mm. the concrete of the driveway. And then I took one photo of myself and it was so interesting because I come back to that. Oh, and then I came inside and I took photos of scones that had just been baked. <laughs> but it was very sad lighting and it looked just dismal. <laughs> it really did. The whole the whole thing did. And I, I come back to it now as like it was this moment of and I remember before going on that little walk of being in just one of the most dark days or dark moments. And it was simply this action of I needed to get somehow outside of my own mind and I took my camera and when you take a camera you get this gets back to paying attention your attentions Mm -hmm. are on something else even if it reflects back to you and it did like the gray and uh disquieted and sick and despair filled spirit that I possessed like it reflected almost back to me in these images and Hmm. yet it was something that could make a mark and I think and could make a a flag in the sand of like, this is a painful season and it hurts. And yet it means something that it hurts. Mm -hmm. And it's not just in your mind. This is something I feel so strongly about now being praise the Lord past that, you know, (laughs) point in my life. And I just watch so many um, young people, my age people, middle-aged people, anyone struggling with depression or anxiety or mental health disorders. And I think the most difficult thing is to get, outside of your own brain and it seems impossible sometimes and so I would say yes to your question Mandy um there Mm -hmm. have been moments when something like that came like went outside of me and then came back to speak to me um, Mm -hmm. that I think that God can use as almost like showing back to you in photos because I remember flipping back through and seeing like oh this is a dark day that's not just in my head or Mm. oh my face looks sad in this photo it, so it's like I'm journaling, not, yes. your photo journaling. Yes, and sometimes when mm-hmm. you are, and when you are in the midst of like a major mental health crisis, you know, I mean, people will talk to you like you're crazy, and you think you're going crazy, you know. And so, but for that to kind of be almost a a moment of being able to say, yes, this is painful and hard, 
and almost making that or that act of declaration, I suppose, aided me in moving through it in moving through like, okay, this is painful, but we can plod through, we can take Mm -hmm. another photo, you know? Mm -hmm. And so anyways, yeah, I think that there have been several moments like that where that's um, great. And this was another one of them, (laughs) which was really fun to well, I guess not fun in the learning, but eventually it, <laughs> when it when it does take its own wings and then, yeah, can kind of be gentle with you back after you've been through a lot. So mm-hmm. there's so many elements here. There's like you mm-hmm. said, just the idea of paying attention, for trying to get get outside of you, really focus on the world around you. And then there's also I'm really fascinated by your process for. This piece that you did, uh, you, you you mentioned it already, Le- mm. Lex Arandi, Lex Credendi. Mm. And uh, listeners, I will uh, try to uh, attach a link to it in the show notes here so you can look at it. And it was also oh, good. Uh, good. displayed in um, our last uh, Imagination Redeemed conference. So it was, it was one of like the, the artwork selected for it. And I, I'm really fascinated by what process you do here because mm. it just – it's one of those things where I – I wish I got it more. Just like th- this idea of like, the, 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 like for me as a really bad everyday photographer to be mm-hmm. like, okay, I'm going to take like three pictures and I'm going to work super hard at it so they're all awesome. So <laughs> did, let's walk through the process. Where did the idea start to have like, yeah. okay, we're going to have hands and the stained glass to start with the hands, the stained glass. What What's going on there? How do you go about doing yeah, like yeah. a fine art photograph (laughs) well i will say this was my first brush with it so i feel like i stumbled into it um (laughs) but and i've done i've done similar things but not not quite to this level um for one i was i had this very conceptual idea at first it was i was doing it for a a master's level class so i knew it had to be decent if if nothing else and uh, so i went about it as just thinking through like okay like what are different ideas I am thinking about. I was thinking a lot about sacramental ontologies and a whole bunch of fancy academic things. And, uh, <laughs> but, but of course, like you have to make that meaningful for the common man and also just myself because I, I can get lost yeah. in sacramental ontology. And so, um, yeah, I began with kind of thinking through like, okay, if you're, what's a series that you're going to take? And, and usually for something f- fine art, on the fine art spectrum, um, simpler is usually better. (laughs) So you start Mm. very simple and then you build from there. So for me, Mm. I was thinking a lot about, um, embodiment. Okay. What comes first with embodiment body? Okay. Hands, physical Mm. something. And Okay. okay. So from that, like, what could you do with hands? So in my head at first I was like, okay, and the amount of times I've used my sister for something is hilarious. But I was like, <laughs> maybe we'll go out into the pasture and we'll do something. She's a dancer. I could take photos of some movement that she's doing. That was first in my head. But then I was thinking through like all like the embodiment piece. But then I was also thinking through imagination. OK, imagination is vast and it's colorful and it's brilliant and it's multifaceted and it's swirling. And it's there's so many things that come to mind when you think of imagination. And so I wanted to kind of overlay those two because I think prayer is both of those. It's embodied. We are in our physical bodies when we pray. And yet it encompasses our imagination and we can go so many places when we pray. And so I... I, I was looking on Pinterest, actually. That's where some of my stuff began. And I was thinking about, <laughs> which I wouldn't encourage everyone to do immediately. Think about it first, and then you can go to Pinterest if you need to. But I would say I was thinking about double exposure imagery anyways, because I'd done it a few times, but it's really hard to do, because at least the way I do it, there's several ways you can do it. You can take two photos and then in Photoshop, <laughs> like overlay them on top of each other. Or the harder way, but sometimes the more precise way, is in your camera settings, you take a photo and then you hit like a set function so you can see it, the photo you just took and then in your viewfinder. And then you take the other photo on top of it. So you're doing both in the camera. Oh, wow. Very challenging because you don't have a lot of time between the two. (laughs) So for these images... (laughs) I would. I had my sister in front of like just a white window with her hands up for the first one, um, and I took that image, 
and you had to get it, you know, sharp enough, like dark enough, because um, for double exposure imagery, only what's in the dark, the shadow pieces, will actually come up. So anything that's in a lighter space in the highlighted section will not appear. So you have to be really thoughtful about where are my shadows and what do I want to oh, put wow. inside the shadows. Yeah. So there's a lot that kind of goes into it. So first took the photo of her hands and then like the middle part of her two palms and then her arms were the darkest pieces and then a few pieces of the um, window pane were also dark and so then I went over to this um, one of the stained glass windows and then I'm just like moving my viewfinder kind of up and down like where on the stained glass do I want to position or or where do I want it to focus on and so there were these um, part of the window was of these two stone tablets of presumably the Ten Commandments. And I just thought, oh, these center right here in between her two palms. That's really cool. I think that might even be (laughs) theological. Let's take the photo now. (laughs) And so took the photo and then moved on. And so it was it was a process of in many ways, like some of the things I got um I took the photos and then went home later and then theologically processed what I just done. (laughs) And that was also a fun thing of just seeing so many different pieces and symbolism. But I would say for anyone that's trying to begin with that, like start small and then you can kind of go larger from there. But it's really about at first, especially the most important piece of this was not the stained glass because those were static. They weren't moving. They were... The body, the hands that were going to be mm-hmm. positioned in a certain way and hands that move and hands that have being to them. And so, yeah, I think that was a harder piece to capture because you had to be still and hold fingers in a different mm. in just a certain way. And that even was a cool like reflection upon like, oh, Lord, the amount of times we change and shift and move and you are unchangeable. And just kind of that even overlay. And that's what prayer is in so many ways. And so, yeah, the process, I would say, was dumb luck in some ways <laughs> that um, these worked the way they did. Um, I think one of my favorite of all the three series, the triptych, is uh, the middle blue one, which is kind of comes down in this V of a window. Mm-hmm. And then there's hands clasping amidst it. And if you look really close, there's... Um, what is either a cross or a sword that's like penetrating the side of the hands. And that is in several ways kind of emblematic of how we clutch to the cross. We clutch to Christ Mm. in dark times and also like the piercing of the body, the piercing of Christ's side during Calvary. And then also, um, yeah, just how the word, which was made flesh and dwelt among us. And that's amidst the hands that are clasped together. And, that was totally on accident <laughs> that oh, that yeah. happened and that that yeah. was like center hands. Um, so yeah, it was, it's been, it was a really cool process and something that I've even been thinking about now, like, okay, what do I, what do I want to do next? <laughs> Can I ever surpass that? Every artist's like deepest fear. I'll never make anything good again, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, that was kind of, yeah, the process. So that is interesting. Mandy, it seems like if we were to bring Liz into our outlining or um, seat of your pants debate, she would, that, that does not sound like the work of an outliner photographer. It does not. It does not. Okay. Well, it's okay, Liz. You're, you're on the other team, but I'm that's sorry. okay. I still appreciate your process. No, you're um, on my team. You're on my team. It's a cool team. <laughs> so... We're running low on time. We still have some time left. And what I thought would be fun. Sorry, Liz, I didn't warn you I was going to do this, but I think it would oh, be fun. But, but so, where's the outlining? You didn't warn? Oh. Ugh. Anyway, well, I'm just I'm kidding. Go ahead. going with the flow for today. But um, Woo! <laughs> I thought it would be fun because photography, like I mentioned earlier, pretty much everyone does it, even mm-hmm. if the vast majority of us are pretty bad at it. Let's say yeah. you're someone like me <laughs> who has his phone. And wants to take better pictures of, you know, landscapes, his kids, um, something artsy like, I don't know, um, a, a, a dandelion in the sidewalk or whatever. I see. I don't know how this, how to do that. But let's, <laughs> let's say you just want – you're just a regular dude and you want to take better photos. What are some basic concepts to start with? Yeah. So basic concepts, um, <laughs> as I said before – 
simple. <laughs> Go simple. <laughs> Don't overwhelm yourself. <laughs> um, as we were talking about earlier, like paying attention. So if you go on a walk each day, which I would encourage everyone, if they don't go on a walk, to please go on a walk each day. Mm. Yeah, take your phone with you, but don't be checking it. Maybe turn it on Do Not Disturb. Like, this is the first process in paying attention. <laughs> and um, and then I would say, like, I think an immediate thing for any photo maker is the first lovely thing they see. Oh, I need to take a photo of this. And they snap a photo and they move on. And I would say slow down and be, like... Be strict with yourself about how many photos you're going to take. Um, so I'm, I'm taking you back to film theory almost. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> but um, like yeah, give yourself, and I would say even, I've done these before, kind of little photo pilgrimages, you know, where you have like a an hour, maybe a 30-minute walk, maybe a 15-minute walk, and you, you're going to go out and, okay, I'm going to take, give myself five, maybe 10 images that I'm going to take. What is it about this walk? And what is it about what's right here? So if you're mm -hmm. on a walk with your kids, if you're at the park with your children and you're watching what they're doing, um, don't just take a photo of anything. Don't just take a photo <laughs> of someone as they're sliding down the slide, which is so amazing and so <laughs> happy and fun. But think about exactly, like, maybe what is it about this walk? Like, how did today feel? And then sometimes I focus in on that. Um, oftentimes, I will take, I'm, I am typical, like many people, I will take photos of my food. I will do that. But it's almost yeah. too, like, why did I take a photo of this particular fruit? Well, because it was very good. And I felt very nourished that day. And then, um, so it doesn't exactly matter what you're choosing to do. But I would say, um, yeah, I think especially now in the midst of winter, there's not a ton of like lovely flowers, but they're coming, they're coming. And so they paying are. attention to like the buds that are coming out and our cam, our phones are so fancy. Now we have these portrait modes, which mm -hmm. you can go into and then you can get really close and then you have to use your finger to like focus in on which part of the bud. Okay. And maybe you have one bud with two little pieces coming out and then you have one with three and then you have one with five. Well, which one am I going to choose? One, three or five ha or two, three or five. I'll probably choose three because it's an odd number. Odd numbers are very pleasing to the eye mm -hmm. and it's kind of amidst a cluster of everything. Okay. So I'll take a photo of just the three little, little buds there. And I think that really, Taking also better photos, I think, comes down to your light in many ways. So if you're going to flip your, your phone up, um, make sure, and you can tell usually, if it's blown out. So you want to probably tap on the screen and then move that little bar down a little bit, which adjusts your exposure. Um, so you can get a oh. clear photo. Yes. <laughs> You've ever seen that little, like, yellow square box? I've pre yeah. I pressed it on accident yeah. before, but okay. I know what no, it did. So that, yeah. Okay, so that for you, little yellow square box adjusts your exposure. That also I helps with your no focus. Idea. Yeah. <laughs> so if you tap somewhere, that'll be your focus. And then on the side of that yellow square box, there's a little bar that goes up and down, has a little like sunlight look on it. And then you can move it up and down to kind of adjust how light or dark you want the photo. So if you don't want the, if you want a beautiful sunset, well, you don't want the whole sky to be white or completely yellow. There's probably oh. textures in it, right? So you can yeah. move the exposure down just a little bit to get oh. all of the textures of the clouds or of the, I'm so glad I could be helpful in this. Oh man, you just rocked oh. my world. Yes. <laughs> this um, is awesome. I would also say um, for taking better photos is sometimes Several of my friends do this and it, it can drive me a little bit crazy, but they go, they tilt their phone sideways and take a photo. Yeah. No, no, no. Really? We, we li no, we live in a level world. So why would we take photos of things sideways like we're in a dystopian novel? So <laughs> we <laughs> at least now, at least now right. we might get there. But right now we live in a level world. So okay. taking your photo, your photo, um, keep your phone if it's vertical, keep it level. Or if you move it sideways, try to keep it on a level playing field. And sometimes you okay. have to you have to work at that. You still get crooked every now and then, but that can be really helpful to do okay. um i would also say let's see there's so many different things that can help you may have to take more than one photo i've seen several people just take one and expect it to be great and it's not well there is a thing called discipline and practice and yeah. re repetition and getting better photos so take a few of the same photos of the same thing <laughs> and you can get better and you can pay more attention to 
okay, do I like this one or did I like this one better? Hmm. Um, and what was more focused or what was more, um, what drew my eye to this, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Um, and then of course my, my, my largest and biggest encouragement is just to watch for the light. Always watch for the light. Where is the light Mm -hmm. falling in your room? My little bedroom that I live in, I have these little windows that let sunlight in, especially beautifully in the afternoon. And it just makes the coverlet of my bed and my bedside table and some of my photos on the wall just look so much more delicious and wonderful Mm. than a normal, (laughs) than a normal tungsten light. And so I'll take a photo of them during that time of day. And times of Mm -hmm. day are really important too. So if you're midday, the sun's right up in the top of the sky. So you're probably not going to get your most favorite photo at midday. Mm-hmm. You'll probably get it more in the morning or afternoon, evening is the, okay. what's called the golden the hour. Golden hour. The golden hour. I know hour. that. <laughs> yes. So, I don't know why. <laughs> right? It's golden yeah. because there's about an hour of just sweet, sweet sunshine that yes. just, it falls in a certain angle and makes everything beautiful. So, yeah. Um, yeah, pay attention to where light is falling. Sometimes I will intentionally not take a photo of something and just look at where the light is falling if I'm in a coffee shop and it's against the wall or on the floor and just look at it and pay attention to where it falls. And also reflections, because if light falls down on the floor, it's going to reflect up somewhere. So if you're outside and you're in a park and it's grassy and green and you're going to take a photo of someone maybe sitting on the grass, the light, which is coming from above, is coming down onto the grass and reflecting up back into someone's face. And that casts a hue, which is often green. So is they going to look green? (laughs) Yes. Oh, wow. So you have to even pay attention to that. If you don't want someone to look a little bit sick, maybe (laughs) don't put them exactly where it's just like, a pay attention to where the light is falling. And who knows? They may want to look green that day. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But those are just some little things for taking better photos. But slowing down, I would say, is the most important. Mindful. Part. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. Well, thank you very much. I, I can't wait to show off my new knowledge of tapping on the yellow box. And I'll, I'll show that to Danielle <laughs> probably know, later right? this evening. She'll be like, you didn't know that, Matt? I'm a little worried about you, but I will be so thrilled with my I'm new so knowledge glad. now. I know. I'm so uh, all right. Well, Liz, thank you so much. We are. I'm so glad that you could join us on the show. So glad you are me and Mandy's boss now, uh, running yes. content for, for Anselm. And, well, listeners, as you can probably tell, things are winding down at the Anselm Society Digital Pub. Fires down to embers. Customers are trundling home and you've polished off your final glass. Once again, the Anselm Society is bringing you Believe to See, which is brought to you in... I'm messing up the ending, but (laughs) Believe to See is brought to you by the Anselm Society Arts Guild. For more information, visit us at anselmsociety.org. Thank you again, and we'll catch you next time.